So it's my honor today to in introduce Lee Jessam. And um, I think probably an interesting aspect of, of Lee's talk is that he's going to be able to talk about some of the things that we've been discussing, but from an actual, this is his academic specialty, uh, which gives it a special sort of flavor and, and a little more data emphasis. And probably it will be more interesting to listen to Lee than me, so I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Given the way the conference has been misrepresented and denounced, I think this is worth saying. I'm an old line liberal. I was an anti-Vietnam War protester in the 70s. I was a community organizer in the 90s. And I ran an indivisible group in 2017. Uh, so when I say I'm an old line uh, lefty, I kind of am. Uh, and that has multiple points, not just to debunking some of the uh, ridiculous ways the conference has been mis misrepresented. It also would be untrue to say. Uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say most people on the left, most liberals, embrace free speech and academic freedom and view the rise of this sort of authoritarian censorship, cancel culture uh, um, on, on the left. Although as several people have pointed out, there are different kinds of problems on the right, um, uh, but that most of us really find that repugnant. Okay, so without any further ado, uh, ado I'm gonna talk about the radicalization of academia. So I'm gonna frame this uh, around four ideas or four hypotheses. Uh, the first um, is that academia is massively, massively left of the American mainstream. Uh, the second uh, is that this has downstream consequences. In academia, you can make almost any claim, like no matter how bizarre or unjustified, uh, no matter how much it is uh, uh, constitutes this sort of virulent incitement to group hatred, if you frame it as some form of social justice, I realize that's a really extreme claim. I plan to document that. Uh, the third is sort of the opposite of that. Uh, in academia, if you criticize or oppose or are seen as crossing efforts framed as advancing social justice, no matter how many facts you bring to bear on your argument, you are at increased risk of being punished, sanctioned, or ostracized. Again, I plan to document that as well. Okay, uh, so let's start with the easy part. Academia is massively left of the American mainstream. So first, well, what's the comparison? It's the American mainstream. I, I, I'm only, to keep this reasonably short, I'm only presenting this one uh, hidden tribes report, uh, but whether you look at Gallup polls or Pew, the results are always about the same. Look, somewhat more than a third of Americans identify as being somewhere on the left from somewhat liberal to the progressive left. Uh, here it's, I think, 34, so it's 37, 38, 39, but it's about a little over a third typically identify that way. Uh, what I also want you to register is that it's less than 10%. That's also consistent with lots of surveys identify as far left. So this is the sort of the American landscape. A third or so, maybe a little more than a third think of themselves as being on the left, single digits far left. Okay, now let's look at academia. Um, this is uh, actually data from, from Langberg, but um, zillions of studies have shown very kind of similar kinds of patterns. What's shown here is the ratio of registered Democrats to registered Republicans across a whole slew of disciplines um, at more than 50 of the sort of most elite uh, colleges, universities in the country. Um, and because it's, you know, ratios are kind of weird to digest, even if you're reasonably quantitative, it kind of takes a minute to understand that once you get into the 15 to 20 to one range, for all practical purposes, this means there's no registered Republicans in the, uh, um, uh, in the department. I mean, there might be 25 and one or something like that. Um, and probably at the point that it's 25 to one, you're keeping your head down and your mouth shut because the risks of, you know, being openly anywhere on the right in the university are, are, are excessive. It's a really good book called Passing on the Right, which sort of goes through how conservatives cope with being in academia. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, the, the top couple of fields, engineering, not too bad, you know, but, but once you get into the social sciences and humanities, it's just, the skew is massive. Okay, so the skew is massive, but that doesn't mean they're extremists. But actually, Nate Honeycutt, my now former student who is about to start work or, or has actually very recently started work at FIRE, um, just completed his dissertation. As part of that dissertation, uh, he conducted two national surveys, one of faculty, one of graduate students. 
Um, and one of the things he asked them was to identify which of uh, uh, several possible uh, political identities they felt described them, they could choose more than one. Um, and what he found with this, this large national surveys is that 40%, 40, 40 of faculty identify as radicals, activists, Marxists, or socialists. Not as kind of on the, right? Not sort of like generally on the left, you know? Right? Radicals, at, yeah, and this includes people who chose more than one. So, and with graduate students, it's even higher. And the graduate student, I think, is important because graduate students are the future faculty of academia. Um, so these numbers, so not only is the, the, the skew extreme, they are actually extremists. Now it's not a majority, right? 40% is not 70%. So, but, but you know, if you, given that these are often activists and several people have alluded to this in other talks, um, uh, that their presence probably exceeds their representation, but their representation is also massive. Okay, well, so what? You know, I mean, uh, what does people's politics matter if they do good science or good scholarship? If, if is doing a lot, of, a lot of heavy lifting there. Okay, um, so that very quickly gets us to the second hypothesis. With, uh, right, the idea that you can make almost any claim, no matter how bizarre, no matter how unjustified, no matter how hateful, if it's framed as advancing some kind of uh, of social justice. And this requires existence proofs, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not claiming that most academics, even the 40% of our colleagues who self-identify as radicals, activists, and Marxists, go around making bizarre claims all the time. They probably make relatively few bizarre claims, uh, but this requires existence proofs of which I have many. And to keep this short and limited, I'm only gonna present a few, okay. One of my favorite, although I have another one which we could go through in the Q&A, just like, they're, they're just jaw dropping. The psychopathic problem of the white mind is the title of a talk given at Yale's grand rounds in its psychiatric program. And Katie Herzog uh, got a hold of a recording of that, shared it with me. And these are some of the quotes some of the statements by the speaker presenting that talk. So I'm just gonna leave that up there for a minute. It's silly for me to read it. You can all read, I think, so. Okay, um, I'm gonna continue. Now, like, what do you make of this? Like it's one person. Who is surprised that there is a whack out academic out there? Like there's more than one whack out academic out there. So what do you make, what does this even mean? That, okay, so I found, I'm, I'm nut picking here, right? In some sense, I am nut picking, but I'm not just nut picking. Remember this was at Yale, or one of the elite universities programs in the country. And what is actually more interesting to me than the, it's just, insane claims by this person doing the presentation are the responses of the audience, which was also <laughs> on the recording. And it's like the fawning gratitude is just, so it's not just a single nutcase. In fact, there was nothing but comment, I only like extracted a few, there was nothing but comments like this. And it's like, make my head explode. The, uh, you, now, we, know, we don't really know, do they really mean it? Was there like a conformity? Was there a group thing, get, thing going on? People were afraid, but no push. It was all, oh, wow, yes. The yes, fantasies of blowing white people away. That was such a great talk. I learned so much from it. <laughs> okay, now, fine. Even though I have plenty more of these, I'm gonna move on from this. You might say, okay, it's a talk, you know, who knows, it's weird social dynamics. That's why we have peer review to ensure that only the highest quality findings make it into the scientific literature. Okay, so I'm going to, as they say in social justice land, interrogate that. Okay, 
<coughs> first, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. There was the grievance study sting <coughs> by Lindsay uh, Bogosian and Puckrose four or five years ago. Uh, they wrote up a slew of papers, I think it was about 12 or 13 or 14 papers, um, making just intentionally bizarre, crazy, social just framed social justice type claims. Um, and they submitted them to peer review journals. And it was eventually discovered, I think, by the Wall Street Journal. They reported it, so they kind of terminated it before it was completed. But by, by the time they terminated it, there were seven papers accepted, two given re, uh, revised and resubmits. And the, you know, the RNRs are probably on the way to being accepted. And one received an award as the best paper of the year in that journal. Okay, so here are some of the claims, here are some of the ideas in a subset of those papers. There was fem. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't. Okay, so <laughs> right, this feminist mind comes. <laughs> it's like you can't make that. Like, like, like if somebody just made this up and it didn't actually happen, you would say they were being histrionic. Then this couldn't possibly happen in the real world. Okay, men should be leashed like dogs in order to overcome uh, patriarchy. And then white students should be chained to the floor and to desks in order to experience oppression. And students who mock feminism should be punished. All of these were, I, I think the chain to desks was in the you know, R&R, the other three were all published. Okay, now you might say, well, that was a sting. They purposely lied. The real peer reviewed literature would never have anything like this, would it? Oh wait, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. I'm sorry, I'm gonna backtrack. Right, so, uh, nine papers, but it's not just nine papers, right? It's the reviewers and the editors. You multiply all that out and you get to about 30 academics who are complicit in the elevation of these bizarre ideas. Okay, now I can get back to my, uh, okay. Um, uh, so returning to the peer or launching the peer reviewed literature, this came out sometime in the last year or so. It's on having whiteness. I don't know if you can see the highlighted thing. So, but I, and I'm just going to enjoy reading it because it's just so much fun to read. <laughs> Paris, <laughs> I, I, I should have got somebody up here to help me do this. Parasitic, parasitic whiteness renders its hosts, hosts' appetites voracious, insatiable, and perverse. <laughs> These deformed appetites particularly target non-white peoples. Once established, these appetites are nearly impossible to eliminate. Okay, so uh, when I first saw this, I actually thought it was another hoax paper. I, I, but it was like for real, as far as I could tell. They, I, the, the journal posted it, then they took it down when there was controversy surrounding it. Okay, putting that aside, after a couple of months of knowing this, it's like the rhetoric here struck me as familiar. So I'm gonna give you a second to, I'm not gonna ask you, but just think, have you, you know, have you seen something like this before? Cause I have, and I'm gonna tell you where I saw it. I'm gonna take a quick step. In contrast to the delusions of Nazis that you see throughout academia, <laughs> this rhetoric is in the actual Adolf Hitler's actual Mein Kampf. Okay, so, <laughs> so here I have them side to side. That one's, I think, big enough. You can read that for yourself. But, but the parallels between the rhetoric is just, it's jaw-dropping. It is absolutely jaw-dropping. Okay. Oh, but so this is like some weird psychoanalytical journal. Yeah, psychoanalysis has had issues for a hundred years. You know, is this really the scientific literature? Well, how about nature geoscience? 2022. What's shown there so far is the title, scientists from historically excluded groups face a hostile obstacle course. This is, and what they're doing here is they're uh, purporting to debunk or replace the leaky pipeline metaphor with the hostile obstacle course metaphor. So I read this article and said, yeah, I mean, I do work on prejudice and discrimination. This sounded overblown and histrionic, but like maybe there was a there there. And there was, <laughs> the 
<laughs> there, there was there was a cartoon. <laughs> the centerpiece. <laughs> Like this is true that you can look it up. Why, if you have your computer or your uh, um, smartphone, you can look this up as I'm talking. This is absolutely true. The center, the centerpiece of this article in Nature Geoscience was this cartoon. Okay, and again, you know, slate box. I mean, that would be real. But this is this is Nature Geoscience. But it's like okay, so I backed off a little bit from my own reaction, and I'm, and I'm like, well, okay. Maybe this is just a creative way to communicate something that is really scientifically well-grounded as they document in the actual article. I mean, there was actually an article there. Okay, so I started reading the article and you know, this, the, the title claim comes up very early and that's now quoted here. However, as many have argued, this passive imagery leaky pipeline betrays the fact that in many ways, the experience from minority high scholars is more like a vicious or hostile obstacle course. So that's, you know, and, and, and that's what's shown highlighted the five to 10 are the references, the citations they use to support that claim. So it's like, okay, it's, you know, let, let's, uh, yeah, it's a short article. They're not gonna go into all the data. They don't have enough space. Let's see what those referenced sources are and what data they bring to bear on this argument. <laughs> Reference five is this tweet. It's this tweet. Now, the first part of the tweet, you know, when I graduated, there were eight black engineering PhDs in the country. I, I, ex I don't I didn't double check that. That may well be true. But that's not what it's referenced, cited for. It's cited for the second, the second part, <laughs> or the third part. It's a vicious obstacle course. And it's a tweet. It's a guy, you know, virtue signaling on Twitter or, or protest, whatever. This is not evidence. This is evidence that this tweeter tweeted this. It's not scientific evidence of any way, shape. Or, I mean, this is, again, make my head explode. Okay. <laughs> that's, so that's reference five. I almost stopped there, but actually thanks to one of my followers on Twitter pointed me to <laughs> reference six. So reference six is an, is an actual peer reviewed article. And I stopped reading after I went halfway through the abstract. And now I will show you why I stopped reading after I got halfway through the abstract because about halfway through <laughs> the sentence appears. <laughs> Nature geoscience. <laughs> I don't know. What, 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 I just don't. I can't. I just. I just like. I, what do you do with this? Um. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Returning to you know that's why we have peer review, show only the highest quality findings, making it the scientific literature. Here is my pushback on that. <laughs> completely ridiculous, which is not, I, I don't want to overstate here. There are good things in the peer review literature. Peer review has some value, but, but, but you just, you know, nonetheless, this, this claim, the one shown on the slide here is wild, is itself wildly overstated. Okay. So yeah, I think I've presented all sorts of real world evidence that in academia, you can make almost any claim, no matter how bizarre or unjustified, if it is, presented or framed as advancing some, some form of social justice. Okay, what about the flip side? You know, if you're perceived or actually critical of social justice programs intended to advance social justice, you're at serious risk of some form of punishment. And I really don't, you know, this is the purpose of this con uh, uh, conference. You know, that's what motivated a lot of this. A lot of the people who've been targeted by such events are here. Um, uh, most of you know most of these stories. I'm just not, you know, this is a very short and woefully incomplete list. So, you know, if, if you have been targeted in this way, you're not here, I apologize. I'm just, I'm trying to move along. The main point is I, you, I, don't, I don't really, I don't need to, I don't feel like I need to spend a lot of time on this. Okay, but in case you didn't know, Fire, which is amply represented here, uh, keeps a scholars under fire database, um, which like every time I look at it or re return to it, there's more 
people there. So what I, it, I first discovered it, I don't know, about six months ago, there were maybe 200, 250 cases. It's now, the last I looked, it was over 700, maybe over 800 by, by this point. And these are scholars who have come under attack some attacks are more successful than others. I mean, in most extremes, somebody would be fired. Sometimes people lose a position. Sometimes they're simply, uh, you know, uh, denounced and publicly shamed, but not exactly sanctioned. Um, they're all included in this, and there's over 700 faculty here. And I saw a clip of Greg Lukianoff from not too long ago um, comparing these data to uh, McCarthy and it's kind of characterizing it as actually worse than the McCarthy era. That if you look at simple, simply the number of faculty who have been targeted in this way, it is more extreme, more extensive now than it was during McCarthy. Okay. All right, so I feel like I've had pretty good evidence for all three of these. Academia is massively left and, uh, um, uh, and, and the extreme left is massively overrepresented. Um, uh, you know, the existence proofs in academia, you can make almost any claim, no matter how virulent or bizarre, if it seems to advance social justice. And if you dare to criticize any aspect of that, you're at risk of serious reputational damage um, in academia. Okay, so what do we do about this? So we just had a panel on it. Some of those recommendations I think were quite good, but here are mine. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, this is three quarters not serious, but there is, a, even here, abandoning all hope, there is something liberating and energizing and empowering about going completely stoic, saying academia, whether this is true or not, academia is completely lost, and now I am going to say and do whatever the hell I damn feel like. Okay, so that's the abandon all hope. And then, huh? then there's always, <laughs> if that doesn't work, there's always bourbon. And then there's this one, which I am more than half serious about. Um, I, I think that one, I found some of the legal discussion of the last panel really interesting. Um, I think Dorian's presentation comes closest to this and certainly resonated with me. And that is, if you accept that most of academia is mostly lost, or that many of our colleagues are cowed into silence, but should the opportunity arise, might be more willing to stand up, one avenue um, short of convincing legislatures to pass new laws is to form our own new organizations and institutions within academia, within our universities, as islands of academic freedom and scientific integrity. As you have seen, some people have done. You have the MIT Academic Freedom Alliance. You have the recent dramatic upscaling in FIRES activities. You have the, the, the uh, Academic Freedom Alliance out of Princeton. Um, and I've one of the founders of a new organization, the Society for Open Inquiry in the Behavioral Sciences, um, that is intended to preserve much of what John Haidt described in his opening talk. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. That's my son after we climbed a 14,000 foot mountain. As I mentioned, previous question, my name is Adithya. I'm an undergrad studying philosophy, poli sci, I write for the review. Um, and uh, so I thought it was really interesting, you know, seeing all this. So thank you for sharing. Although there is a sort of, uh, you could say, critique that I think myself and a lot of other people, undergrads especially, feel, which is that it's almost like talking about these sort of like crazy things that happen in academia almost like gives conservatives a sugar rush where we, we can laugh and we can clap and it's great. And then when it comes to finding the solution, you know, it's just more rhetoric about owning the libs and drinking leftist tears, right? Like that, that's all. And so, um, and then when it comes to actual solutions, it seems like we continue to want to work within the system to form our own organizations, as you mentioned. Um, 
why not open up the possibility of simply smashing the system itself? So, for example, like, you know, it's Nero, it's, or it's Diocletian persecuting the Christians. It took Constantine to, for things to change. Um, so instead of starting grassroots, why not dream bigger? Well, okay. So uh, one, I'm just being personal and parochial. I'm an academic. <laughs> like, I kind of like my job. <laughs> so <laughs> I would rather not, not have my job. But treating your point more seriously, um, I do think uh, that both from the standpoint of young people setting down on their paths in life, becoming whatever, seeking gainful employment in one way or another, um, uh, that uh, it is absolutely appropriate and viable and there are more and more avenues for uh, finding ways outside of college and, and graduate school. Um, so I think Teal's talk captured a little bit of that. Um, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to uh, these, uh, the idea of the creation of alternative avenues. I think market forces have created some. So uh, the simple version is coding schools. There are these three month, six month coding programs that uh, you can uh, you know, take there. I don't know, they vary from, I don't know, probably five to about $20,000, $25,000. And then you're ready to enter a job uh, in, in, in IT somewhere. Um, and you don't need to do the four years, $450,000 of college debt to, to do that. So that's at the, uh, um, at the level of, of students sort of figuring out how to take the next steps. And from the standpoint of science, um, I actually, the, the, um, um, uh, the, this essay that Dorian Abbott asked me to write for the heterodox STEM, predicting the state of science, you know, one, three, 10 and 30 years out. My take was that the, you know, with the installation of DEI bureaucracies accelerating that it's not clear how science is going to thrive within academia. There may eventually be some peace or truce that permits that. To me, that's not clear. But even if it completely fails within universities, the university is not the only places that science are conducted. And in fact, in my opinion, I'm, they're sort of um, engineering more than anything else, but sort of engineering, drawing on the science. Um, now Musk is now most famous for Twitter, but actually I think both uh, Tesla and SpaceX are amazing accomplishments. And that was done outside of academia. Um, so I, I, that is my best guess actually, that if academia fails, uh, that science will proceed outside of academia. So I'm very sympathetic to the point, but I, you know, uh, I, I am, you know, I, I hope to be doing this for another 20 years. So it doesn't, I hope it doesn't fail too soon. Yet. So following up on that, Peter Sidiakono from Duke, um, can you point to some wins, you know, in terms of academics where the research has sort of survived despite going against uh, the narrative? Because that gets at whether we should be abandoning hope or not if there are places where we do see success. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, let, let me be more careful. I, I, I don't think, let me answer that concretely with something I know. So I'm a psychologist. Psychologist has been racked by what's known as the replication crisis for the last 10 years. The replication crisis refers to the fact that some disturbingly high number of our studies, even our famous studies published in our best journals don't replicate when independent researchers try to replicate them. Ballparking it, the run rate is about 50% success, okay? Now, 50% success is not zero or two or 10. Um, so that does mean that despite the many dysfunctions that do characterize my field, there is often a there there. Now, I don't think we're very good here now at identifying which of the 50% are true and which aren't, but 50% is much higher than if it was all garbage. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I could go through a list of things in my own field that I think are, that have held up over time, but, uh, you know, I, but I, that, that would be a, a narrow and parochial talk. So I'm sure there are things across the disciplines that have actually held up. And I do not mean to be damning in dis everything that goes on in academia, all that, that would be going too far. 
Yep. I, Richard Lowry, UT Austin. Um, so I think you did this sort of nest of like, hey, here's a crazy person. Then we go up as like, oh no, it's systematic because there's fields. Oh, it's systematic because there's journals. I think my, my feeling is you kind of stopped a little too soon because there's still like, there are people who are, you do sensible things, do sensible research, but they did nothing to stop this process. So what, you know, what happened that, you know, actual serious scientists and actual serious humanities scholars didn't quash this when it was coming up? And, you know, do we have any hope that those people will do anything now? No, I think that, you know, uh, can I get the slides back up? I don't know if I just hit the power as the tech people here, you know, let's see if this just works because I have some backup slides that partially address that. So if I do that, oh, okay, fine. Um, so it, it's why I mean, my best guess as to the narrow, on the narrow question of why they didn't stop it is because they embrace it. They want it to happen. They're, they're the advocates. And so in the spirit of keeping the talk short, I cut out my fourth hypothesis, which I'm now gonna briefly go through. Um, and that is that academic organizations are actually leading the erosion of academic freedom. Um, so what I presented is a lot of the level of the individual scholar and the paper and editors and reviewers, but you have a lot of nonsense going on um, in the halls of power throughout academia. And this has been touched on by other people in this conference so far. So when you have DEI statements required um, as the entrance fee of admission to the academy, basically what, well, first place, it is worth po pointing out, I think, that, that DEI in general is affirmative action on steroids. I mean, it is like trying to mobilize uh, you know, the, the universities in the uh, 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 towards the goal of what is plausibly viewed as uh, affirmative action. And so I don't have the data. Well, actually I do have the data way in backup slides, but I, I, somebody else said this, they're absolutely right. About 60% up to about 80, 85% of every racial ethnic group surveyed in national surveys by groups like Pew um, uh, uh, oppose affirmative action. Which is why, you know, California, a majority minority state, one of the most left states in the country, has repeatedly rejected affirmative action. Americans have a strong consensus against affirmative action. Okay, so if DEI statements are required to be admitted either for a job or for, to present research at a conference, it is a form of either not state, not legally compelled speech, but professionally com compelled speech for anyone who opposes those initiatives because you know, you, uh, it's completely reasonable. A young scholar comes in and say, boy, you know, to present at this conference or I need a job, I, you know, I'm gonna make my peace with doing this. I don't really agree with it, but I'm gonna play the game and I'm gonna say how great my contributions to DEI are because I need a job or because I need to attend national conferences to have the visibility to get promoted and get tenure and all that kind of stuff. So in that sense, it's a form of socially or professionally compelled speech, but then there are the refuseniks. No, 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 you know, I am not, I refuse to, to bend the knee to your affirmative action ideology. In that, and so if that's the case, you don't get the job, you don't get to present at the conference, and therefore you don't get to disseminate your ideas. So it's either a form of compelled speech or it's a form of censorship. And this is being inst instituted you know, nationwide. It's, it's for, for, for jobs, for actually graduate admi admissions, beginning with undergraduate admissions, um, and in my field in social psychology in one of its major conferences. Okay. Um, I think Luana might have talked about this earlier, but um, societies, major professional societies are now imposing ideological litmus tests on what they accept for publication. So I'm only gonna, again, to, so that I don't go on and on and on, I'm only gonna go through nature of human behavior, but the same thing is true for the Royal Society in Chemistry. So they have this editorial sort of announcing this new policy, science must respect the dignity and rights of all humans, and yeah, I think it was Luana talked about the advocacy, advocacy groups and, and, and uh, uh, anti-abortion groups, right? So, so, so they're gonna consult with ethics experts and advocacy groups where needed. So, so 
my, I mean, it, it is a completely absurd policy, and the absurdity of the policy can be seen here. <laughs> so, so if I'm a member of an advocacy group that finds that guidance offensive, what the hell are they going to do? And it was actually Anna Krylov who articulated very much that argument, um, I don't know, a year or so ago in response to the chemistry thing. So, so my, my long answer, uh, Richard, to your question is, because they embrace it, endorse it, and are the, the, the vanguard of making it all happen. So Jules van Binsbergen, the Wharton School. So as economists, we struggle a lot with trying to disentangle what we call permanent shocks and transitory shocks. So this, the one behavioral bias that people have is that we tend to over-extrapolate recent trends that we've seen, right? So, and I think that between the different talks that we've seen today, Jonathan Haidt very much went into since 2015, which seems like a very recent thing. Peter Thiel was more talking about a secular decline for 50 years where things have been on the downward path. How much mean reversion to this do you think we can meaningfully expect? And also, once more competition to academic institutions are introduced, then don't you think that the universities will, through the competition of the students, be forced to at least mean revert to some extent, or should we just give up on that? <laughs> uh, you know, I opened up my essay for Dorian's thing on the predictions that I have no confidence in my ability to predict the future. And I think very few people should have confidence in their ability to predict the future. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't really know. I, I do think, and I, I was not the first person to comment on this, that in the wider culture outside of academia, the worst of this sort of soft cultural revolution-like manifestations of wokeness have receded somewhat. People are not being fired as much as they were in summer and fall of 2020 for minor missteps. You have the New York Times with a series of articles advocating for the importance of free speech in a variety of ways. You have Nike, no, not, not Nike, um, Netflix, uh, telling its woke employees if they don't like the you know, atmosphere there, they can find a job. So this is very different than 2020 and 2021. But that's outside of academia. You know, you also have the rise of sort of an anti-wokeness agenda among Republican-dominated states. And I'm ambivalent about that. I mean, some of that, I think, is reasonable. Um, I'm, I'm actually sympathetic to some of Amy Wax's uh, proposals there. But I think it's also clear, I think Greg Lukinoff has referred to some of the bans on uh, critical race theory in higher ed as egregiously unconstitutional. Um, so there is this pushback in the wider society. Some of it may itself be overreach. But within academia, between the constitution of the grassroots and the installation of these vast DEI-type bureaucracies, I, I, don't see, I don't see a, regre a regression to the mean prior to this anytime soon. You go on far enough, everything's unpredictable. Let me ask Jules question in a slightly different way. I mean, the marketplace for university, I mean, you documented nicely the very leftist orientation of the faculty, many universities, and I think the publications, you know, are just the tip of the iceberg of that, all these, all these developments. Maybe that's what people want, right? Maybe the current young generation is very woke, they're very happy to be far left. It's been said, if you're, non, if you're young and not a communist, uh, you don't have a heart. There's a second part of that sentence too, but maybe that's uh, <laughs> but maybe that's what the parents and the students want. They want these leftist, you know, woke universities, and maybe that's what we're giving them. Otherwise, I'm wondering why there aren't counterexamples of that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what parents want. I, you know, I would be surprised if uh, the parents want woke universities. I, I think. There, there's lip service paid to the truth-seeking functions, and you know it's not only, it's not always only lip service. Um, I, I, I think I, I would be surprised to discover parents embracing the ideo ideological infusion into science and the like. It, some, you know, psychology. The first law of psychology is some do, some don't, right? But in general, I, I would be surprised although lots of things have surprised me over the last five or 10 years, so who the hell knows? But I, you know, uh, beyond that, I, I don't know. 
I really don't know. I'm Dorian Abbott, U Chicago, over here. But my response, Harold, is uh, students want whatever they have to want to get into Harvard. <laughs> No, that is actually a really good point, right? I mean, students want to get a job, they want to go into medical school or become a lawyer, right? They, they'll do what they're told and so, you know, what they think they need to do. So that's true. That's absolutely true. Although there is, within the last 10 years or so, there were a series of papers concluding that Usually, though not always, students do shift left when they go to college, but that most of that influence was from their peers rather than from the faculty. There's a very recent paper that didn't really distinguish between faculty and peer influence, but found a pretty profound shift to the left and a shift towards moral absolutism. So something is going on. Um, in universities. I think that's pretty, that, that is socializing students into this sort of consistently more and more left-wing worldviews. Okay, I think, oh. I don't know if you were, all right. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Elizabeth White from San Jose State University. And one of the things I was thinking is, you know, we see, I'm an anthropology professor, so we see that the different, um, the different departments have different amounts of leaning to the left. Um, and one of the things I wonder is how much do you think GE um, has affected the trickle down from anthropology, for example, where um, cultural anthropologists are, you know, oftentimes um, have very bizarre uh, ideas. <laughs> to um, STEM where if all the students have to take some of these GE classes, and of course with California, we just now have the new GE requirement, uh, uh, ethnic studies requirement. And how do we fight back against that? Uh, you know, look, <laughs> uh, my, uh, the solutions that I, were all individual activism type, you know, create new organizations, I was a chair of my department for seven years, spread over at 12, it was not consecutive, thank God. Um, and after seven years of chairing my department, I have no idea how administrators think or do things. So, I, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, how, how does that get, how does the dean sit down with the provost to decide, yeah, we need this, I have no idea. After seven years as chair. So. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, my name is Francis Widowson. I was a professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary. I was fired in December 2021. I'm talking tomorrow about this very, very important academic freedom case in Canada. I was battling the phenomenon that's referred to as wokeism. Um, uh, Pluck, Rose, and Lindsay, uh, the academic term is reified postmodernism. <coughs> Um, I'm just wondering if, if that's what you see the problem as being in many of these things. And also I'm wondering, I've heard this many times today, this left-wing ideology. I don't understand how identity politics is seen as being left-wing. It is trying to change the hierarchy from supposedly the white uh, you know, straight males dominating everyone to the other side of the intersectional scale dominating everyone, uh, like just inverting that. So it's, it's really basically a hierarchical scheme in reverse, and I don't understand how this is a left-wing uh, type of ideology. Well, I mean, look, the, the, uh, um, you have authoritarianism on both the left and the right, and uh, it, the, the kinds of things that you describe are, uh, you know, a form of left-wing authoritarian. I, you know, I actually, this is another thing that I actually did have here, if I could find it. Ah, there we go. Um, so, uh, it, it, for 50 years, 
the, uh, the lore in much of the social sciences was that there is no left-wing authoritarianism on, you know, in the democratic West. Just, we looked and we looked and we looked and we looked and we just couldn't find it. And then about five or six years ago, two independent teams started working really quite hard on measuring left-wing authoritarianism in the democratic West. Um, and one team, uh, uh, did it simply by flipping the targets on one of the most common right-wing authoritarianism scales. So rather, uh, you know, rather than uh, um, intolerance of sexual minorities, it was intolerance of religious Christians. So you, you flip that around and, you know, you, all of a sudden you get evidence of left-wing authoritarianism. So, but the point is that it has these three big sort of components, you know, intolerance, especially political intolerance, willingness to censor one's opponents, and aggression, willingness to punish one's uh, ideological opponents. And so, you know, I, you know and I, I would argue that there's ample evidence, certainly, for that kind of behavior in academia. So I think that's the answer. Well, how is this left? Well, it's just a left-wing form of authoritarian intolerance. And that part is actually kind of easy. I, I do think the, the you know, my uh, nature geoscience example actually looks a lot to me like an infection of critical race theory, critical social justice type theories into the natural sciences. So if you want to make claims about the power of discrimination, you're actually doing social science. You're not doing physical science. You're not doing geological science. And the idea that you can just kind of make shit up on the basis of tweets and cartoons, that's, you know, it's about creating a narrative. It's not about actually having evidence that supports the claim. So whether or not there are any, and I don't remember the article well enough, whether, you know, whether Derek Bell is cited in that article, I have no idea. But the, the spirit of that paper is very much how I think of critical social justice. It's you tell a narrative. And that's what's important, is you tell a narrative. Peter Blair uh, from Harvard and Hoover. Um, I want to say first, I think to Dorian's point, I do think that there are a lot of Harvard students who are doing really interesting things that they're genuinely interested in, based on my experience um, as a scholar in residence there and a faculty member. So I want to defend Harvard a little bit there. I, I also want to make a call out too. So DEI has become a kind of a boogeyman, right, to say, here are all of these woke people looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have to take a big step back historically and ask ourselves the question, from, from much of the life of the university in the United States and the West, half of the population women were excluded by fiat from producing, right? And so those of us like me who've studied physics and who've done differential equations, we know that the particular solution of any diff EQ is gonna depend on the initial conditions. And the initial conditions were 100% male. And we have to wrestle with that fact. And we have to think about the ways in which there was a kind of affirmative action that existed in the university. And so given that, well, what are we going to do in these institutions to create access and, and, and offer a, a positive vision of making sure that rooms like this are reflective of the true underlying distribution of potential within the university? Right? If we think that rooms that look like this are reflective of the distribution of talent by race, by gender, by geography, and so on and so forth, that, I think that that's the money-making question. So it's not enough to just kind of like beat up on what is being done, but to say proactively, what is a constructive way to make sure that a kid, regardless of whether they're born, where they're born in the US, or across the world, has access to the resources to express their innate God-given human potential? And I think when concrete proposals are offered, to make sure that human potential is not stifled, then we won't need these additional structures to increase diversity in ways that might be unpalatable. Corey Clark and Bo Weingard have a paper, uh, 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 report that came out in Quillette recently, the last month. Women are now a majority in the academy. That problem it may, may not be solved in every corner of the academy, but writ large, the problem you described of complete exclusion of women is basically over. It's not completely over in every corner, but when saying that, what you also have is massive domination by women in many corners of the academy. Uh, so y you have that. Now, there are other groups besides men and women, and uh, you know, I actually, without going into lots of detail, um, uh, if there are, when there are, uh, not if, because there are, when there are non-authoritarian <laughs> approaches to uplifting people and enhancing diversity within 
uh, both the classroom and the, uh, the university, depending on the details, I could get on board with them. Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, I just wanted to get back to uh, the issue which was raised here uh, about how do you characterize left or right? And of course, we know, basically, everybody knows that the spectrum is actually compact. It's a circle, right? So maybe, maybe it pays, actually, to identify what you call the left today, which is based on racialist ideas, identity politics, all sorts of things which really belong to the, to the extreme right. So uh, maybe we should turn things around and call them fascists. That's what they are. Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm not fascist, authoritarians, I'm fine with that, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I actually want to go back to uh, the question of competition in academia, because I think it's a good one. But before I do that, you know, one of the things that irritates me most uh, about, and certainly not the speaker, but is this, this, this belief that in the past there was a lot of discrimination, and the way we solve that is we take current people who have nothing to do with the past and discriminate against current people. My view is if you have a strong view that in the past there was a lot of discrimination and you're 60 years old, that means you benefit from the dis discrimination and therefore you should give up your job. And if you're unwilling to give up your job because you benefit from the discrimination, I don't want to hear about other people. And I find it annoying as all hell that anybody would have the gall to say, this young man over here who happens to be a white man, he has to suffer for the past discrimination. It's ludicrous. But back back to the competition, I think the problem with the competition rule, first of all, I don't agree that there isn't already an effect. I, I mean, this is anecdotal, but amongst admissions, I think there's been a rise of the University of Chicago relative to the other institutions. And I think that's precisely because the University of Chicago has taken the stands that it has. Okay, so, the, so I would say there is some effect ready of the competition. But the real problem is the competi academic competition plays out over decades or even centuries, right? I mean, what is the cost to Stanford? Or let's take a, a, a university that is just um, off the charts, Yale. Okay, what's the cost to Yale if Yale says, you know, the business model where we admit rich kids and we admit poor kids and the rich kids continue to get, will give donations to, supply, to, to, to uh, help the poor kids. We're giving up on that business model. We're only admitting poor kids. No more benefits for rich kids. Yale's got a huge endowment right now. It has no effect on Yale whatsoever. It will have an effect on Yale in 40 or 50 years because they won't get the donations they were getting previously. But that takes 50 years to play out. So I, I don't... I, I reject the view that they won't, that, 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 the, that the competition doesn't exist. It exists. It's just it's a very long played out uh, 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 um, uh, competitive mark. Last question. John, I'm John Chisholm. I was, uh, I served on the MIT Corporation, our board of trustees from 2015 to 2021 and was president and chair of the Alumni Association from 2015 to 2016. If you look at our undergraduate student body at MIT, the same may apply to your university as well, the most underrepresented segments are not racial minorities. Uh, the most underrepresented segment is what I call the other half of the United States. The 25 least represented states in the United States, uh, graduating students on a per capita basis, are represented at only one third the rate of the most tw uh, represented 25 states. These least represented 25 states tend to be rural, lower income, and center right. There is no advocacy or uh, representation for students from these states at all. They are completely invisible. Uh, now, that may not seem very consequential, that, uh, just, uh, that there's no attention focused on geography. Uh, but it's much more consequential than it may seem, because students from these states tend to be different, not merely uh, geographically, but socially, culturally, uh, economically, and politically. And so there's an entire swath of cognitive and intellectual diversity that we're missing out on uh, 
in the M MIT undergraduate student body by unduly focusing on a few dimensions of diversity. So by unduly uh, focusing on a few dimensions, as we do, uh, we actually under, further underrepresent students from other important dimensions. Uh, so rather than use a few dimensions with a hammer, as we currently do, we need to use many dimensions with uh, a light touch. Thank you. Uh, so I completely, I, I, that was the last one. I completely endorse that. In fact, I have a paper coming out in one of the big site journals called Diversity is Diverse, and it hammers at exactly that set of points. Um, experientially, I was probably the first faculty in Rutgers psychology department to have a diversity statement on their um, uh, professional web page. This was 10, 12, 14 years ago, um, uh, which included all the conventional kinds of diversity, but I also included um, our, uh, religious students and politically conservative students who need to be set, stated, be given the status of the university. And the effect of that in the last 10 years or so, I like to describe as having cornered the market on conservative students in social psychology. Um, and they are good. They are very, very good. It just, it doesn't take, it just, what it takes is saying, yes, it's welcoming. This is not a hostile environment that you might find in other places. But consistent with that, you know, this is another thing I didn't really get to present. The, this, this is the status of, you know, the irony of inclusion in academia is the way it's being implemented is excluding 80 to 90 percent of the country on political grounds. That is, but you look at the data on the on faculty, faculty are 80, 90, 95 percent left. Uh, you know, no matter how they get there, you know, when, when it's when it's three percent or five percent or six percent black or thirty-two percent female, then all these things need to be done in order to get those percentages up. And you know, we could debate on how reasonable the specific actions are. But regardless, when it is you know, <laughs> when it is you know, 100% left and getting, or 90% left and getting more and more left so that people in the, there are almost no people on the right or even in the middle throughout academia, this form of inclusion is excluding most of the country. And that is absolutely in the process. It's not even going at, it is in the, uh, we are in the process and I think John Haidt presented some of these data of academia losing its credibility outside of progressive circles because of that. I came out late in my mid-30s. Uh, prior to that, <clears throat> if I were selected, elected, or promoted to some position, I knew it was because of what I had contributed or accomplished, not because I'm gay. Now that I'm out, I can't always be sure. No one should be subject to that indignity and uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, so we need to be cautious of undermining the very people that we are trying to help by uh, being unduly focused on a few dimensions and, as I said, using a few dimensions with a sledgehammer rather than a light touch. Thank I'm you. not religious, but I'm in. <laughs> Carl wants to make one comment and then you know that demographic is the deplorable demographic and not a joke that is the, the you know the, the, the those states and that rural and, and that socioeconomic level that is the deplorable class, and I think they're being actively rejected, not just passively overlooked, so. Okay, great, thank you, Lee. Uh, actually, let's thank Lee again, everybody.